Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this talk about sharing IPv4 addresses by partitioning the port space. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm an engineer at Cloudster. I also help uh, co-maintain the SOC map code in the kernel, so you can sometimes see me on the mailing list. And this work has been done together with my uh, colleague, uh, Marek, who couldn't be with us today, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping we can have some nice discussion about the API at the end. So let's get started. Uh, before I jump into the problem and the solutions we have come up with, uh, I need to give you a little bit of context uh, what our production looks like. Um, so we all know that uh, when we use the internet, we need a public IP address from which we can source the traffic and connect to various web services. But as it turns out, uh, no two public IP addresses are the same. And I don't mean that they don't represent the same 32-bit value. So you see uh, public IP addresses on the internet uh, have traits associated with them. And one such trait uh, would be geographic location, which is tied to the address you're connecting from. Uh, based on that location, uh, the web services will actually tailor the content that you receive so that when you uh, search for a pizza place, you will actually get results for pizza places that are hopefully nearby. Uh, geographic location is not the only trait that we have out there. IP addresses also mapped to a reputation. Um, if uh, your public IP happens to have a bad reputation, then you might be penalized for that and be faced with captchas that you have to solve before accessing a web service. Um, so we uh, run various proxies, but we also offer a VPN service that is based on WireGuard called Warp, where users establish tunnels to our data centers and we forward requests on their behalf. And we also run an Anycast network where every of our data centers announces the same IP prefixes. Um, so we have a situation where users on the internet connect from various public IP addresses and they can actually be attracted or land on any of these data centers. So what we have, if we have users connecting from, well, many possible locations to potentially every of our data centers, and we us trying to mirror the traits of the IPs that the users are connecting from where, when we forward the request so that we can provide the best user experience. Like for instance, in this example, if uh, a user uh, would establish a VPN tunnel uh, to Cloudflare from an IP that is associated with a location somewhere in Cork, Ireland, and it would happen to hit our data center in Dublin, then when forwarding user requests to the destination server, we'll try to choose an ingress IP that has a location that is closest to the user location, so somewhere in Cork Island, so that the user gets properly localized requests, uh, responses. All right, so what's the problem here? Well, we have users connecting from various locations and we have many data centers. So uh, in order to facilitate it, we can imagine um, two extreme solutions. Uh, one where we would have an IP for every potential location, geographic location, on every of our data centers, for which we'll need lots of IP addresses. And that's totally doable for V6, and we've done that, but it's prohibitively, prohibitively expensive for V4, unfortunately. But it has some nice features, 
like we are always able to egress locally, whichever server receives a tunnel user request, we'll be able to forward it to the destination. And we also get excellent reliability there because if one server goes down, any other server can proxy the requests. On the other side of the spectrum, we have a very cheap solution where, we'll, where we could have just one IP uh, provisioned for each geographic location that we need to support, and we assigned it to one of our servers somewhere. The problem there is that we will we'll almost, no, almost uh, never egress locally. We'll have to forward all the requests that need to use this particular location to this one server that has this IP assigned. And of course, we get very poor reliability. So somewhere in the middle, uh, there is a compromise on price versus reliability, uh, where we can imagine that we would have an IP for every possible location per data center, and that IP is shared by all the machines in the data center. Now for that, we still need some IPs, but we don't need any more millions of IPs. Uh, we also don't need to uh, support all the locations in all the data centers uh, to mostly be able to service requests locally. And we get pretty good reliability, right? Still all the servers in the data center can handle all the requests and sometimes we need to forward traffic. Um, why, why is it so important to strive for local egress for us? Well, if the user hits a server that is not able to directly forward its request to the destination, uh, then it has a negative effect of, on the latency. We have to bounce the request from server to server before we can go to the destination. Uh, it also makes uh, production management harder because uh, you get uneven load. Uh, some servers, in addition to handling requests coming in directly from the users, will also have to process forwarded traffic. Uh, if we can always directly egress from the server to the destination, then we get load that is proportional to requests per second coming in on egress. So how, how can we implement this? Well, the traditional solution for that would be to use uh, SourceNet on the router. And that is actually the setup that is common in our home networks. We have a router that keeps track of all the egress flows and rewrites the source IP. It, however, has a major drawback that the router is a single point of failure here. Um, so if we wanted to make it a little bit better, we could go for a distributed SNAT, uh, which requires shared state between all the servers in the colo that need, needs to be kept up to date. It's a bit more reliable, but also complex to implement. So the question is, can, can we make it simpler? Um, and yeah, yeah, we can. And as you have probably guessed by the, from the title of this presentation, we could also share the public IP address between the servers by partitioning the port space. In this example, each of the servers gets a slice of 512 ports from the ephemeral range that they can use to create outgoing connections. Uh, now, we also have to route the return traffic to the right server. So an important thing to note is that the return traffic has to be routed not only by destination IP, but also by destination port. So we have servers which, have, which share an egress IP, a public egress IP, and have, they have uh, portrait assigned to them, and we have applications running on these servers that need to 
create connections, open connections from this ingress IP, but only within that port range. How can we do that? Well, the naive and uh, impractical solution would be to uh, set the ephemeral port range to, the, to our port range assigned to the server um, and also enable the local source port sharing so that we can reuse the local source port as long as the whole four tuple for the socket is unique and let the kernel find a free port for us. This, of course, has a major downside that uh, we are affecting, the, we are here changing the ephemeral port range for all the processes running on this server. And also we are assuming that the port range is the same for each egress IP that we'll be using here. So um, we have to work around that uh, from user space around this limitation. And we can do that by just sampling uh, the, the port range that is assigned to our servers and trying each port one by one until we find a free one. Uh, in this case, we have to uh, enable uh, local address sharing with Rayos address or otherwise we'll get failures at bind time and we will be able only to have as many outgoing flows as three local ports. That works great. We have it in running in production, but unfortunately it only works for TCP. Um, so what about UDP? Well, UDP is harder uh, because TCP and uh, UDP semantics for connect differ. So if you are using Rayos address on your sockets, then uh, when you try to connect two sockets, bind and connect two sockets to the same four tuple, TCP will report a conflict when or there already is an existing socket that uses their four tuple. However, UDP, on the other hand, will happily create two sockets that are bound and connected to the same four tuple. Um, how can we work around that? Well, we have this beautiful hack that Marek came up with and I really tried to prove that it is racy, but it doesn't seem so, where we resort to querying the bindings over Netlink and abusing the Rayos address socket option. Uh, if you're interested in it, I highly recommend his blog post that I linked to. So one of the major jobs that the operating system has is to provide useful abstractions of the available resources to the user API. And it seems like today opening outgoing connections from a selected port range is hard. So can we do better? Well, again, this we have already seen, and this is ideally what we would like to have, but without these downsides that I mentioned. So what if we could actually define or set the local port range per socket, of course, still while respecting the per net and S global setting, just to narrow down the ephemeral port range. Uh, I've given it a shot uh, and it actually seems it's pretty easy to uh, implement. So I've posted uh, RFC patches. Uh, of course, we need additional fields in the socket object uh, to store the low and high bound, which is the biggest downside of, uh, of this solution. Apart from that, we need some glue code, but it's pretty simple because we can actually stuff to uh, 16 bit values into an integer. And once we have that, uh, when we need to find out what the ephemeral port range is, either at bind time or at the connect time, we just look up the per net NS ephemeral port range and clamp it down to the value set for the socket. 
So that works for TCP, but the question is, is it enough for UDP? Does it work for UDP as well? Well, it doesn't, unfortunately. UDP, uh, once again, is on another difficulty level. So why doesn't it work for UDP today? Well, um, you can set the IP bind address no port option for UDP sockets, but it probably doesn't work as you would expect. So setting that option will not lead to source port sharing, even if the port apple of your socket is unique. Uh, setting UDP bind address no port today on a UDP socket means that you're delaying the moment of auto binding the socket from the bind time to the connect time. So can we make it work? The delayed auto bind uh, happens today in the connect handler if we uh, detect that the socket doesn't have a source port selected yet. And we're gonna delegate that operation to the get port protocol op operation. For UDP, that protocol operation is implemented by UDP lead get port, which is a pretty long function, but in general, it has an if statement that handles two cases. One, uh, first one where we don't have a source port yet, and we want to find a free one, and that is what we're interested in. And the second one, which we're not gonna be looking at today, if the user has specified the source port and we just need to check if it's free. Uh, both of them are followed by a common block that just publishes the binding. If we look at how UDP today looks for a free source port, uh, we're gonna see that, well, we're gonna pick a number at random there, generate a source port from it, and based on lower bits of the 16-bit value, we're gonna pick, uh, we're gonna find a slot in the UDP hash table and walk all the sockets in that hash table chain to find which ports are already busy. And we're gonna build a bitmap that marks the busy ports. Then we're gonna try our port picked at random and check if it's free. And if not, we're gonna then check another port, but one that maps to the same hash slot table so that we can reuse the bitmap that we have just created. Only after that, we're gonna move on to the other slots in the hash table. Uh, the function that is responsible for walking the chain of sockets in a hash slot is called uh, UDP lib L port in use. And not what it will do, uh, it will look at the various attributes of the existing sockets, uh, like the network namespace they exist in, their local address, the device they are bound to, if the source port sharing is enabled. And based on that, it's gonna make a decision if that port number is actually free or can be shared maybe, or if it is already uh, exclusively owned by an existing socket. So why am I telling you about all this? Well, it seems like uh, we can use all this battle-tested code uh, to make IP bind address uh, no port work for UDP because we are really trying to do the same thing. We just want to be a little bit stricter about detecting the conflicts. So instead of using uh, UDP lib port in use, we need some new function. One that would be very similar to Elport in use and would look at all the same attributes, but in addition to that, we also have to pay attention to the destination, address, and port of the existing sockets, connected UDP sockets. All right, um, so uh, seems like we, we have an idea what we want to do. The question is, how can we implement it? Well, we probably don't want to change the signature of get port because that has various users and unfortunately doesn't have access to the 
address that uh, the connect handler gets from the user. So we probably need a new protocol operation, one, th one that has access to the socket and the address passed to connect. Well, as it happens, there already is a protocol operation. Uh, I've just learned about it uh, recently uh, that we can reuse. It is currently only used by SCTP code and it's called bind add. So how can we glue that into the connect handler? If we put all that logic that I just described in a bind add implementation, well, a reminder, this is what lo it looks like today. And we can imagine that we're gonna extend that um, so that when we are doing a late auto bind at connect time, if some condition is met, we're gonna delegate to the new handler, which is stricter about finding the source port. And if not, we're gonna fall back to the behavior we have today and delegate to get port. What is that condition? Well, it has to be something that is backwards compatible, obviously. We can't make it the default. We can't break today's behavior. So what I would propose is to require a combination of Reus address and IP bind address no port set at the same time. And I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, also, this would only make sense if the user has already selected the source IP address because the connect handler gets, gets called before the egress routing lookup. So we can't accept a wildcat address because it, we haven't selected a source address yet via routing. So why would it make sense to check for this combination of two flags? Well, that's because if you enable Rails address on the socket, setting byte address no port doesn't actually change anything for you. You will still today get two conflicting sockets uh, bound to the same four tuple. You won't get notified of the conflict. And if we change that behavior so that conflict is reported, you are very unlikely to hit that because you would have to, uh, well, hit a conflict with an existing uh, connected UDP sockets only when and only run out of ephemeral ports. Um, yeah, one more thing I wanted to mention. I just posted patches for RFC patches for discussion for this this morning. Um, yeah. So uh, this is this. These are most promising solutions that we think we think, uh, but they're definitely not perfect. So we've been um, thinking about some alternatives that I want to quickly mention. So if we don't want to fix IP bind address no port, we can go for a lighter option and just give users means of detecting. Uh, conflict when we're connect, creating a connected UDP socket. And for that, we could introduce yet another socket option. It would be kind of silly, but it would do the job where the user uh, will create a UDP socket, sets Rayos address, which in UDP lingo means, hey, I'm about to create a multicast socket, but then kind of changes her mind and said, no, I actually want a unicast socket. Please tell me about any conflicts with our connected UDP sockets. Mm, yet another direction we could go to is uh, we could leave all the baggage uh, that we have, API baggage that we have today behind and perhaps prototype a new syscall and define semantics from scratch. Uh, it could be inspired by ConnectX uh, syscall from Darwin where we specify both the local address and the remote address. And of course, we also tried to, to solve it with BPF because uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Um, and uh, we can attach a BPF program to uh, connect C group uh, hook 
And that program could actually take a look at the value, at the address the socket is bound to, and at the address the user passed to the connect syscall, make a socket lookup from the BPF context, well, and then check if there's a conflict and fail the connect syscall if that's the case. Uh, and that can be done, but we have found that this solution is racy because the BPF hook is actually pre-connect. So we have no control uh, over processes trying to bind to the same address. We, have, we are not able to synchronize the publish step of this, which happens after the BPF hook. So for that to work, we will probably have to have another post connect hook like we have to see group post connect hook like we have today for bind so that we can implement some synchronization uh, via BPF maps and log a range of uh, addresses for the duration of the connect and unlock them once we're done. All right, so uh, yeah, we have uh, a couple ideas where we have posted patches for, for what we think is the most promising direction. But uh, the big question is how we can actually make the API support this use case better. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for your attention and I am all ears for your ideas, feedback and questions. Thank you. About post connect, there is now a post connect hook. I'll talk about it soon. So there is a LSM Percy group post create, and there might be something post connect. So maybe that should be enough. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I think uh, uh, we've chatted about this on the mailing list. Yeah. Yeah, but I like the API. I think the if you can do it without all those BPF, it should be easy. I guess specifying the range seems natural. Uh, I just have a question about the number of sockets uh, you expect to to use this 512 range for a particular server. Because the, the, at the lookup phase on the ingress path, we are going to scan a big linear list. So I'm, I was wondering about the performance of that. Well, we, we haven't seen of a an increased load in the interrupt context with the flows we're having today. I mean, obviously the um, quick traffic is still on the rise. So uh, uh, as we see more and more quick traffic, perhaps that will become a problem on the ingress, but right now it has been working well enough for us. The quick server are very different because they are using the, the connection identifier to do the DMUX. Yeah. You don't have one socket per flow because that wouldn't scale. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the quick user can roam between source addresses and that's why uh, the connected UDP socket is not an exact match for the quick use case. But that is what we are using today because it allows us to not have a demultiplexer for UDP traffic in the user space and the threads can have a socket that they just use, uh, uh, well, all right, let me take a step back. So this is egress flow we're talking about, right? So we are the client connecting to the destination. So we don't expect to roam from one IP address to another. That's why connected so UDP sockets in that case might make sense for us. Yeah, I'm wor always worried about um, UDP uh, needs. Because right now we don't have the full hash table, like four tuple hash table. Right, yeah, connect. Exactly. There is only a two tuple hash table. So we have to look up a potentially very long list. And so I'm thinking about uh, maybe in the future we want a full four tuple hash. So maybe that's the next step. And then all these issues are. Yeah, if, yeah exactly. In second I'll... order we just disappear because when you do full uh, connect, you do full lookup and then find a spot. Exactly, yeah, I was looking at uh, introducing the four-tuple hash table, the, like we have the e-hash for TCP, for UDP as well, but that seems like pulling out the big guns, so 
for, for now, not, I resorted to something simpler. There's also another question I had. Um, the changing the power range, ephemeral power range, is already available per name, namespace. You also could use a different namespace. All uh, right. For, for your application, you don't need to change the, the default host uh, setting. You can have a application one. That's true. Well, that comes with a challenge of setting up routing outside from to to route traffic outside of a dedicated namespace and back into the namespace. That's that's the overhead there. And we try to well, most of our services run in the initial network namespace. We don't have like a containerized workload on the edge. I think that the whole ConnectX idea is a non-starter. It seems to have a severe case of argument diarrhea. Right. Do you have any more questions? Anything on the chat? Oh, you can reach me and Marek uh, via email on we are on Twitter. So uh, yeah, if you have any ideas or questions, we're happy to chat after afterwards. Thank you.